I have to exit out and come back and uh, apologize for that. So let's, um, let's open on a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, thanks so much for the day. Uh, help us to always uh, remember the importance of the birth of your son and the lessons that we can learn from that and how uh, many people were not prepared for that and how we need to be prepared for the the next return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. So uh, just help us always to keep in mind the importance of his birth uh, and his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection, his ascension and his coming again. Uh, bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, this is going to be uh, sort of a a mashed together thing. I'm going to try to keep this to an hour in respect of your uh, holidays. And uh, if you have a question, I'll try to get to it. Please put it in all caps and I'll try to get that to it. So here we go with uh, just some of the uh, things that um, I've been looking at. It has been just absolutely crazy week. Uh, I have tons of tabs and everything open. So if everything crashes, I apologize for that. So just a reminder, we talk about, so today we're going to, by the way, it's today's, I believe the eighth day of Hanukkah. Uh, so happy Hanukkah. Uh, Hanukkah is very important. Uh, without Hanukkah, there's no Israel to be around when Jesus was born. And that's very important. Uh, that saved the temple. It saved a lot of things, and so the you can read about that in First and Second Maccabees. I don't think that that's scripture, but it's certainly uh, a good historical record, uh, particularly the book of First and Second Maccabees. In fact, you, they've even made some recent discoveries of uh, Maccabee era coins. Um, a I think fifteen or so. Uh, you, when you drive in from Ben Gurion Airport to Jerusalem, you'll go past the area where the Maccabees were from. Uh, they rose up in revolt and preserved the temple. And, and the temple was there for Jesus' first coming, for the Messiah's first coming. So we talk a lot uh, about the uh, convergence of events and um, everything is converging. So this is just sort of a grid that I use uh, acceleration, convergent logistics, and understanding. And I, th I think we're seeing a lot of these come together right now. Things just seem to be happening very, very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, the logistics aspect of some of these things. I have a, some comments about that and uh, understanding. So we base a lot of this on the verse in Daniel uh, 12, verse 8, 9, 10. And I heard, but I understood not, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. In the first part of Daniel chapter 12, it's talking about the fact that people are going to go to and fro, and knowledge will increase. Now, certainly, I think that's a, there's a double application to that. Certainly, we live in a time where things things are happening very rapidly and knowledge is increasing. Uh, I would say that, as I say before, it's, it's artificial intelligence. It's not real wisdom. Um, so the, um, and then I think the other uh, thing we need to keep in mind is Matthew chapter 24, where Daniel makes reference. I'm sorry, Jesus makes reference to Daniel. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, so it tells us who wrote Daniel, tells us Daniel's very important book, tells us something that we're supposed to be looking for. And so we can sort of see that centered around the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and the things that are going on there. Uh, let me make just a couple of quick comments about some things that continue to come up. If I come here and I criticize Russia, which I am prone to do, uh, because I do not trust Putin, I do not think he's up to... Uh, much, if any good. It does not mean I'm pro-Ukrainian, okay? It, I think we need to be nuanced enough to know that you can be against Russia, but you're not necessarily all in favor of Ukraine. But Ukrainian people are suffering. I'm going to show you some stats here that I think are just absolutely uh, shocking from the World Population Pyramid uh, website. But So we need to just uh, 
watch out for these things. So here's some covers from some recent books. Um, Foreign Affairs, The Age of Uncertainty, a couple months ago, and then The World Ahead 2023, and some of the things that they see happening. And you can kind of see it's it's interesting. The Economist published this a few weeks ago, and they have, you can see right here on the, the cover, they have the Patriot Missile battery. Oops, let me to click that. Uh, they also have things a lot of energy, drones, satellite, uh, shipping, um, and then robots, artificial intelligence, and that sort of thing. So um, they seem to know it's, it's not that they're profits, but they seem to know a bit about what's going on. So here's some things that uh, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but just sort of to set the tone, this is an article from a couple of weeks ago in the uh, Times of London, why many British Jews will be horrified by Israel's new government. So what you're seeing happen is you're seeing this narrative being built, the, the narrative that anybody who isn't, you know, in line with left-wing policies, Marxist, woke policies is extremist, full of misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and they just can't be trusted. So you're seeing that narrative that that they've applied to people on the conservative and right side of American politics. They're applying it now to Israeli politics. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't maybe some th legitimate concerns about some things that are going on in Israeli politics, but the overarching thing that I think people need to be aware of is the narrative. Um, so just listen to what this uh, this article in the Times of London said. With neighbors from hell, it's little wonder Israelis elect hawks like Benjamin Netanyahu, who's set to be sworn in as prime minister for an unprecedented sixth time. Yet even Bibi's razor beak looks blunt compared to the predators he's given top jobs to. The new coalition government is a veritable, veritable police lineup of self-declared bigots and malcontents who support Give the Netanyahu, Net, Netanyahu a path back to power. This lot shouldn't be allowed anywhere near the public. And that's that's a sentiment that a lot of people share. Now, uh, and I'm not going to go into this very much. I just have a couple comments about this uh, report that came out from the J6 committee here in the United States, the United States Congress. It was a complete made-up job. It was designed to do one thing, and it was designed to get make it so Trump can't run again. They made a number of criminal referrals. Uh, the report itself is uh, about 850 pages long. And they talk about all the way through, they've talked about this is going to be trans, we're going to be transparent. We're going to show you everything that's going on. Uh, everything is, you know, everything's going to be wonderful. Uh, it's, it's going to be complete. You're going to see all the information. And now my understanding is that they've sealed so they did a bunch of interviews, they did depositions and that sort of thing. And other than what's in the report, they're sealing everything. So they're not transparent. If they were transparent, they would release all the tapes. They would release the thing. And I, I'm seeing reports. Uh, I saw an interview with um, a gentleman just recently, and I can't remember his name right off the top of my head, who's been in prison uh, uh, for almost two years now since the events happened. There are people that weren't anywhere near the Capitol building that have been arrested. Their lives have been ruined. And nobody, nobody ever talks about them. The, the media does not want to talk about this. This this guy in prison, and, and maybe he did some wrong things, okay, but he's been held in solitary confinement for the majority of his two years in prison. And the conditions are just awful. But nobody ever says anything about this. And, and I it is shocking that this is happening in the United States, that we have uh, political prisoners like this. So this is, and I was going to do a highlight of highlights of the year, and then I got sidetracked. So maybe next Sunday we'll do sort of the top stories of the year. By the way, on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern time, I'm going to do a, a live interview with uh, David Fiorazzo on Stand for the Truth, q90fm.com, q90fm.com. Just go there, q90fm.com, click on Listen Live, 
And that starts at 10 a.m. Eastern for an hour. Um, I always tell David it's the fastest hour of my life. Uh, there's also an interview I did while I was in Jerusalem two weeks ago today uh, with the Goslings. You can find that on their YouTube channel. So here's a story, for example. This is from PJ Media. Main school socially transitioned a 13-year-old girl without her parents' consent or knowledge. Uh, this is happening way too often. Um, the um, Merriam-Webster Dictionary just updated the definition of girl, and they did a similar thing to the definition of boy. And they've added this uh, phrase down here, a person whose gender identity is female. So they did the same thing for the boy, just a, a person whose gender identity is boy or is, is male. Um, but what about all the non-binary people? They're, they're discriminating against them, I guess. And this is a big issue, for example, in Scotland right now, uh, Scotland has relaxed its gender rules so that you, you don't even have to submit proof of anything psychological or anything like this, that you're, um, you can just say, I, I'm a female doesn't make any difference. And this is causing a big uproar. The, uh, the feminists are upset because they think it, it denigrates women. Um, so, so you have this interesting convergence of alignment between people on the conservative side and, and radical feminists that don't like what they're doing. So this is, uh, apparently this a big editorial in the, um, times of London, about uh, the fact that uh, Westminster is going to come in and step in and do something about this. Uh, they're going to, the UK can, can veto what Scotland does. And then here's another law that's put in place. Spain has said a trans law uh, is to, uh, going to allow gender change from the age of 14. And if you're age 12 and 13, you need permission from the courts and it also says that the law also bans conversion therapy, imposes fines for attacks on LGBT people, and overturns a ban on lesbian couples registering its children under both parents' names. And so this is so they ban conversion therapy, but they don't ban cutting off body parts and permanently sterilizing young boys and girls. Um, this is these laws, I think, are just. Um, uh, monstrous, I guess is the best way that I would say it. And they ignore the fact that there is uh, a higher suicide rate among people who have transitioned. And you can read the stories, the stories are out there, but the media never talks about that. So if you look at the mainstream media, you'll never see these stories, but they're pretty easy to find if you want to talk about it. Uh, this is also was indicated, this is in the Times uh, the other day, Parliament asked staff if their fathers are female. So we live in we live in very strange times. Uh, this is um, an article. I, I think this is from the Times of the UK that they seized enough fentanyl in the United States last year that would that was enough to kill every person in the United States. Think about that. Uh, and I think we're being attacked. A lot of these cartels are coming across the border unchecked. Uh, and if you do anything to stop it, so for example, Arizona was erecting kind of a crude barrier using uh, shipping containers and razor wire, and the uh, Biden administration went in, the Biden administration went in and got those uh, shut down. Um, well, this is this is from this is more from the um, uh, the Times of or the controversy over the definition of a woman. Uh, this is an interesting story. Now at Fellowship Bible Chapel, by the way, we did uh, cancel church today. We, when we got up yesterday, uh, we were having trouble getting our parking lot cleared. Somebody had been up there on Friday, the people that cleaned the building and they got stuck and had to be towed out. So we need to get the thing. There were drifts and that type of thing. We had about where I live, we had about six inches of snow, as you can see on the picture behind me. Um, it's been cold. I think, uh, this morning it was about, uh, nine degrees, maybe 10 degrees. It's, it's warmed up quite a bit. It was, uh, 
40 below wind chill. I went out yesterday to snow blow off my driveway. I had to, PM was warming up a pair of gloves while I was out working. I had to come in and change my gloves at least five times because my hands got so cold uh, so quickly. So, but a lot of churches canceled church on because it's Christmas, uh, which seems kind of unusual to me, but that's, uh, that's the way it is. Um, I was going to make some comment about this. This is the Pope's thing from about seven uh, years ago called Laudato C uh, on care for our common home. Um, I don't think we need to go into that this week. Here is uh, an interesting article. There's been all kinds of files dumped about Twitter. Um, I saw a video this morning of uh, Elon Musk saying, you know, it appears that every conspiracy theory about Twitter appears to be true. Um, they were working with the FBI. They were working with government agencies. They had direct communications, direct contact, and they censored people. They blocked people. They dropped, they knocked their accounts out. So this is a good article from uh, Professor Philip Hamburger a week ago in the Wall Street Journal, who says that, yeah, I think there is a basis that the social media censorship is a crime because they are conspiring with the government. It's clear that they conspired with the government. There's just no question about that, that you cannot conspire with the government to violate somebody's um, constitutional rights. Uh, and I think this is a, I think this is a fertile ground and I'm sure there'll be cases filed along these lines, but we don't know how litigation like this will go. I mean, uh, Carrie Lake, uh, who lost the election for governor in Arizona, filed a lawsuit. They tried it. They found some things that weren't done correctly, but the judge dismissed the lawsuit uh, yesterday saying no harm, no foul. I mean, yeah, they did some things wrong, but you couldn't. there was no clear and convincing evidence that this was done. So you're going to have uh, Arizona. You're going to have uh, Arizona is now California East. Uh, Katie Hobbs uh, being elected. I think they also have a Democrat for Attorney General, uh, Secretary of State. So things, whatever, whatever was going wrong in Arizona is just going to accelerate and increase, in my opinion. I mentioned this a little bit in my midweek update chat GPT. This was mentioned quite a bit at the Christian Media Summit that I attended in Israel and Jerusalem a week ago. Um, this is an artificial intelligence app that you can download. By the way, if, if you go to download it, I'm not telling you not to download it, but you need to understand that there are fake chat GBT apps already in the app store that come from China and they're just there to steal all of your information and that type of thing. But what this does is you've talked to this AI and you can get it to uh, write a story for you. You can, and like, for example, here's a big article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, and everybody's talking about this. The ChatGPT app was released, and I think it had the fastest download of any app for phone in the history of apps. It did a million downloads in a week. And you can do it, you can get it to, uh, write articles for you. There are people who write articles for uh, newspapers and that type of thing. And they're wondering like, is this going to steal my job? I mean, can I, can the app write a contract and replace a lawyer? And there's a lot of people who think that this is what's going to happen. But the other thing about this is it, it's sort of down, you download it now and you, it's uh, desensitizing you to the potential problems. So this is a, um, I think this is a big problem. We see a lot of this with artificial intelligence. There was a, I cannot remember his name and I haven't been able to find the video of it yet. I don't know if it's been posted from the media summit where this um, business guy who does startups and that type of thing, he came to uh, the conference and he um, was telling us about, you know, all the, like unicorns in Israel and the, um, um, and, and so in, in the percentage, if you look at the percentage of Israel, it, that Israel 
constitutes the population of the world. They should have one unicorn, maybe one. And they have like a hundred. These are people who finance startup companies and a significant amount of the startup capital for tech companies and that type of thing is going into Israeli companies. And I think it's somewhere, uh, I don't have my, I took some screenshots. I think it's 20, 30% of all the money in the world is now being funded, funneled through little Israel, uh, which doesn't even constitute maybe 1% of the world's population. Um, it's pretty stunning. But this chat GPT, everybody was talking about it, the business guys, and like, here's one that, you know, somebody tricked it into um, making a bomb recipe. And I just think that there's a, a desensitization that's occurring with these things. The Biden administration is also funding research uh, to develop artificial intelligence that detects microaggressions on social media. Again, this is just, um, this is from the Washington Free Beacon article. More specifically, the first phase of the project develops algorithms and models for identifying and explaining um, gendered microaggressions and short comments on social media, first unsupervisedly, then with active learning, given limited supervision by trained annotators. In the second phase, the project addresses the challenging task of detecting bias framing about members of the LGBTQ community. You can see this is what you can't say anything about anybody uh, and develops data analytic tools by operationalizing across languages, well-established social media psycho psychology theories. Uh, so that's, that's in process. Uh, here's another article from, I th I'm going to think this is the New York Times last Sunday. It's time to say, put down that burger. And, uh, and the guy from the startup, the business guy who spoke at the media summit in Jerusalem was saying, now, nah, you know, we got to go to plant-based meats and that type of thing. And, uh, our meat, meat-based artificial meat, whatever they call it. It's just, uh, it doesn't sound very appetizing to me. This is also an article, this is from the Atlantic Council uh, about a week ago that the United States is well on its way to developing a right now bank to bank digital currency. The Bank of International Settlements has come out and said these things. Now, I'm gonna talk just a moment here about demographics. I talk a lot about demographics and the point of demographics is the world is changing. The world is changing very rapidly. Um, the collapse of demographics in a lot of countries that I think are mentioned in Bible prophecy indicates to me that maybe th those things are closer than we think. Part of that is because of the um, uh, fact that these countries want to preserve their legacy. They want to do what they want to do and their countries are collapsing. But this is just an example. So everybody, we always talk about Europe and Bible prophecy and my view is that it may work out that way. I'm not convinced that it will. It's one of the things that I consider as a possibility. But look at this. So in 1900, the population of Europe equaled three Africas. Europe was much larger population-wise than Africa. By 1964, that was down to two Africas. In 1993, just 30 years ago, Europe and Africa reached equality in population. 20 years later, it now takes two Europe's in population to equal one Africa. By 2037, it'll be three. And by 2047, it'll be four. That's a um, pretty interesting thing. So I'm going to switch over here to my um, browser. Let me just talk about a few things. So, well, let me go to the uh, population. So this is, this is an interesting thing. So this is the world population, uh, bell curve. And so you can see down here, you know, the younger people, um, and it's divided between male and female and it shows the population. The world population has just recently hit eight, eight million. Uh, so we would be right in, here but it's changed over time so if you go back to 
let's see, 1985. You see how the, the you see how the bell curve has changed. So you go from 1985 to let's go to 2025, and you can see how the bell curve has changed. That used to be a lot of babies at the bottom, and now it's it's flattening out. But look at look at some of the countries here. So let's go down here. Let's look at uh, Western Europe. This is Western Europe's population. Do you see how they're not having babies? And you see the population um, is just about ready to start declining, and it will climb very rapidly. But if you go to a country like, say, Central Africa, population is increasing rapidly, and it's a very poor country. But Afri Africa is doing this uh, quite. Um, they're they're growing. I mean, the African increase in population. I think as they get more successful, the population increase will slow down, but. Uh, I think I talked to you about a study. There was a French book that came out that looked at the growth of population in Africa. And they said that, you know, within the next, let's say, 30, 40 years. And again, whenever I say that, everybody says, oh, so you don't think the Lord's not coming back? I'm like, I don't know when he's coming back. I know that I think it's getting closer. But I'm just saying if it stays at this trajectory for the next 30 or 40 years, Africa could have as many as... Um, four cities in a five cities in Africa that will be close to a hundred million each in population. So right now I think the largest city on the planet is uh, uh, Tokyo, which has around 30 million people. So imagine there are going to be five cities that have three times as many people as Tokyo does right now. And so that's going to change things. And the, it's not likely that the, the people in Africa will stay there. They'll immigrate other places. And so it, it, it will lead to tremendous change depending on the values that they bring with us. But, but look, for example, here's Japan in this chart. Uh, hang on a second here. I'll make sure I'm okay. Here's, uh, here's well, here's another country. Let's go here. Uh, for example, here's uh, Germany. Do you see the decline in Germany by 2100? I mean, it's like it's like half the people. Some countries are even worse. Here's Nigeria. That this country is. Uh, this is, by the way, populationpyramid.net, and you can set it up for like I set it up for 2022, 2025. Uh, here's Nigeria. You see how that country, so right now, 2025, you know, it's, uh, its population is going to boom by 2021, 2100, um, triple. Um, and it will have a city that's probably got 100 million people in it or close to it. Uh, let's see here. I want to do, show you a couple countries. Here's Japan. This is pretty shocking. Do you, do you understand, I, I, I'm not saying it like you don't understand, but I think we need to understand that this is shocking as to what, uh, so right now, you know, Japan is about a hundred and, uh, they were at 128 million here by 2020, uh, 2020, they were down to uh, 126 million. So the losing population right as we watch, and they lost a million people last year. But you get down here to uh, 2,100 there and 74 million, and it's probably going to be worse than that. Another country here that's losing uh, population rapidly is uh, China. Uh, here we go. So you see, you see their curve. They have a rapidly aging population. Uh, they have probably close to 70 million or more, maybe 100 million men right now who do not have the ass, the uh, possibility of having a marriage partner. <coughs> Here is, uh, let's look at one more. Uh, oh, let's look at Israel. How's Israel doing? This is kind of interesting. And there you go. Israel's on the ascent. And uh, so they're they're going to double in population over the next period of time, assuming you know again, assuming the uh, Lord does not return. So that's that's kind of interesting. 
and we live at a period of time. So that's, I'm going to shut that down. Uh, so that's populationpyramid.net if you want to go look at that. Uh, this is, um, any of you who live in the Midwest, our wind chills were around 40 below as we're getting storms in Buffalo. It may be the worst storm they've ever had in Buffalo ever. Uh, we had bad, uh, back when I was in law school, 1977, we had a blizzard. Uh, we lived in Indianapolis at the time. I seem to recall there was some time in Indianapolis. I remember going out to the store during one of these storms. And it was like 58 below wind chill. So it's not like 40 below. Okay. Yeah. We've had worse. And, that, and like every year we lived in Indianapolis after I graduated from law school, we had temperatures in the 21 to 27 below range, at least once each year. So it's not like it's the worst, but it's the, the, the large area that it's covering this time. Um, uh, so Buffalo is just, look at, this is uh, uh, Google Maps. This is uh, Buffalo today. Um, all those red lines mean that the roads are closed because they're having four to six feet of snow, 60, 70 mile an hour winds. And my understanding is they're getting another hit tomorrow from the north. Uh, so like Niagara Falls, uh, you can look here, this whole area, like all the way over to uh, Rochester's just completely shut down. They're having lake effect snows. For those of you who don't live in uh, near the Great Lakes, uh, the water is still warm, but the cold air blows across it and causes snow to form. So when we lived in Cleveland for a year, um, 30 some years ago, we would live in a secondary snow belt where we would get uh, some light secondary lake effect snows, but we would get up in the morning when there'd be 10, 12, 15 inches of snow that weren't there the night before. I went to the office one Saturday morning. I was in my office for two hours. I parked on the street. I came out, there were 12 inches of snow in the car. I drove a mile south of downtown Cleveland and there was no snow anywhere. So it's, it's very dependent on where the wind blows, but Buffalo is just getting, just getting hammered. So that's uh, true. Okay, so let me go back to my slides here. I'm going to talk about this in just a moment. I've got to find my slides. And okay, so demographics. Now, this was kind of an interesting article. Slate, you know, don't talk about politics, uh, but Slate is saying, oh, you need to tell your family at the, the dinner table on, on Christmas about, you know, you got to tell them why the Hunter Biden thing just doesn't mean anything. But then there are other people who talk about, you need to educate them on the effects of Charlie Vector or 019 er and that sort of thing. Uh, this is uh, also a big story. Uh, the people behind FTX, uh, Sam Bankman Freed, uh, was released on $250 million bail, uh, and he claimed he only had $100,000. So people are putting up bail for him, and I guess that's okay, but his girlfriend, who you see here in this article, uh, she's pled guilty to crimes, and so some of the other people that were involved in the um, upper echelons of this company, I guess my guess would be that if Sam Bankman freed went to a lawyer uh, today, the lawyer would say, you know, I, I don't know how many million dollars I want for a retainer. Uh, it's going to be a very complicated case, but I think I would be fairly confident in saying that um, any of the top drawer white collar lawyers, and I know some of these people, when you sit down at a evaluation of somebody who's like Sam Bankman Freed, you're going to get this, um, uh, you're going to be told this, uh, Sam, you get no deal. You are going to trial because they're going to make an example of you. Now, I don't know if they're going to do that because there's a lot of money that he's poured into Democratic campaigns and they may be trying to suppress that. I would say that it's um, either something's being done to keep him from testifying in public. He was supposed to testify in Congress and then got arrested, which shut down his uh uh, testimony before Congress, which would be, it's kind of an unusual move for prosecutors to do that because they want people to talk because the more they talk, the more they have to hit them over the head with when they actually go to trial. 
So there might be something going on there. I don't know. But it also seems to indicate to me that the fact that they've filed at least a, a, an indictment against this uh, girlfriend, that they the evidence of fraud is just absolutely overwhelming. I've been involved in some big cases like this. And I know that from the collapse and bankruptcy filing until the indictments came down were uh, three and a half years. So it, these these are very complicated cases. So I think the fact that it's been done so quickly is they want to suppress some of it, but they also have overwhelming evidence of fraud in this whole thing. Uh, this is a uh, article, uh, Changing America, Church going and belief of God stand at historic lows despite a mega church surge. And I, I would say that it, it's possible that what they should have said is church going and belief in God stand at historic lows because of a mega church surge. That's very uh, possible. Let's look at this in person church attendance plummeted by 45% in the pandemic. Uh, at least one fifth of Americans today embrace no religion at all. I think that's probably an understatement. Um, unless the 20% doesn't include people who believe in themselves more than in any higher power, uh, then I would say that it's, it's probably much higher than 20%. But, um, and this is just, you know, what, what's the impact going to be on culture? Here's an update on the Abraham family house. Uh, this is from um, a guy in the, uh, I think he's in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, recent picture. Uh, they're not quite done. I think they had planned to open it in October, but there's been some delays in construction. And they are, um, they're probably going to open sometime in the spring. Um, here's a, uh, we are on a journey to Ur. This is what this one person says, where all of the children of Father Abraham will reconcile. What a beautiful symbol of the wondrous future of peace we will share together. So this is Chris Lam, but it includes a, a mosque, a synagogue, and a church. I think that um, it's it's clear that this is a very ecumenical thing, and I think it's not necessarily a good thing. So I will say that while this is the Abraham family house in Dubai or in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, I believe this is the real Abrahamic family house. This is uh, where I was a week ago, Friday, uh, about 72 degrees. Look at that blue sky. Uh, this is in Hebron. This is the tomb of Machpelah, Machpelah the uh, structure that Herod built to commemorate the um, burial place of the patriarchs, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah, uh, Rachel, Jacob's other wife, is buried up in Bethlehem. Uh, and you can go to those tombs today, and you can go here. Uh, this part is fairly accessible. We were there on Friday morning, Friday afternoon, it was during... They have prayers. The mosque side is uh, not was not open. There's a synagogue side that was open. So the the top part of this structure, by the way, uh, this was built by Herod, um, and you can see they they have a menorah up there. They have a flag of Israel, and then you also see the mosque part here, and you can see the crescent, and then the, of course the two minarets. This upper part was added uh, much later. Uh, than the time of Herod. So at the time of Herod, this this top part would not have uh, would not have been there. But this is clearly this is the same building that took place at the Temple Mount. Herod built three places. He built at a place called Mamre. He built at a place called um, uh, the Temple Mount, and he built here at Hebron. Uh, so this is um, a um, very important place. Uh, just. And, and like I said, I was there a week ago Friday. I took this picture. Uh, sky is incredibly blue. It was about 70, 72 degrees, uh, a little bit nicer than it was here in Ohio this weekend. But this uh, this area right here, you can see the wall was discolored. Uh, this was called the seventh step. Um, after one of the Muslim conquests in 1257, um, year 1257, 
the Jews were barred from going into the structure. Um, they never got access to the structure for 710 years. So the only place that they could go to pray was here at the seventh step. This is in Israel, in their homeland, a structure built for them. They were barred for 710 years from going in the structure. So you need to process that. In fact, here is a little, and I'm going to try to do this. And uh, let's see if I can, whoops, hang on a second here. I need to add a tab, add a video. This is a Yishai Fleischer. Um, Okay, hang on a second here. I gotta. In the last few years, Hebron has become the. Okay, this is uh, Yishai Fleischer. He's the uh, official spokesperson for the Jewish community of Hebron. Uh, they, about 1% of a 1,000 Jews or so live among several hundred thousand Arabs. And uh, so Yishai, I went to his house for Shabbat. Uh, we could go Friday, wonderful evening with he and his family. I think I played a video clip of his wife last week. So here's Yishai talking about uh, an Arab guy who comes into the Jewish part of Hebron to complain about apartheid. Here we go. This week, featuring Isa Amru, he's a local provocateur and a master of anti-Israel demonization, and he stood right here. If not now, is partnering with me and others to offer a digital alternative. You know what's weird? Isa Amru is an Arab, and he's standing here in the Jewish section of town, and he's talking about our apartheid against him. Segregated streets. This might surprise you, but Jews are only 3% of Hebron, and we're not allowed in 97% of the Arab section of town. In the last few years, Hebron has become the ground zero of the anti-Israel narrative. So-called human rights organizations bring tourists to Hebron, but they show them a very thin slice of life here. Their goal is to demonize Israel and portray it as an apartheid state, make Israel ugly in the eyes of the world. But let me show you around. Okay, so this is the real Hebron. 97% of the city is controlled by the Palestinian Authority. And as I mentioned, no Jews are allowed in here. Arab Hebron is the richest of the Arab cities in Judea and Samaria, the so-called West Bank. 40% of the PA's economy is produced in this city alone. There are 17,000 stores and factories which export 5 billion shekels worth of products a year. There are four hospitals, three universities, and an indoor basketball stadium that seats 4,000. Now, this great dome that you are seeing is not a mosque. It's one of the biggest malls in the Middle East. It's a nine-story indoor mall where you can find Kentucky Fried Chicken and Domino's Pizza and all the accoutrements of a modern, sophisticated commercial area. If the Jews of Hebron want to eat something, we got a pizza place. That's the only thing we got. Let's go in. Hi, Adele. How are you? Mmm. Brooklyn-style pizza here in Hebron. So, yeah, there is a giant story here in Hebron. It's the story of the Jewish people being reborn here. 3,800 years ago, our forefathers and mothers were buried here. 3,000 years ago, King David was king here in Hebron. And we've had Jewish continuity throughout all those centuries. And we are reborn now here. So if there is one thing that I do agree with, if not now, and Isa Amru is, come visit Hebron. I was attacked by the very simple many times here. <laughs> So that's uh, sort of indicative of the uh, uh, the way that things go. So this is, um, so let me go back here. Oh, so I have a couple of videos I want to play for you. Um, let's see. Here is, um, hang on here. Oh, 
Oh, so here's one. The, these are sort of not in order. So this was a lady in uh, it, not in, in the UK the other day. Um, you got to hang on a second here. So I'll ask you once more, will you voluntarily come with us now to the police station for me to ask you some questions about today and other days where there are allegations that you've broken public space? Uh, if I've got a choice, then no. Okay, well then you're under arrest. So this lady was uh, standing outside, uh, it might have been in Birmingham, England, uh, standing outside an abortion clinic, and the police came up and said her now. So it's always interesting to watch these discussions on Twitter. So, you know, the Christians say, look at this lady, she was just arrested for praying. And then all the secular people, pro abortion people, said, no, she wasn't arrested for praying. They had an order against nobody's allowed to be there. This is a safe space and she's not allowed to do anything. She's standing there and the police says, are you you're praying? She goes, well, I might have been praying in my head. Okay, then you're going to be arrested. So, listen, this is clearly a suppression of, of people's free speech. Uh, they can go in there and they can slaughter babies, but somebody can't stand outside silently, no problems. And then, of course, everybody on Twitter started, oh, she's been there before. She knows better. She knows she's not supposed to be there. Um, and so she's arrested and taken away. This is what uh, happens all the time. This is just ridiculous. But this is the world that people want. Watch this video. Um, give me one second here. Um, oops, wrong, wrong tab. Share screen, share tab. Okay, watch this video. This is this is what they want. Uh, this is a thing called Ecto Labs. Watch this. Uh, watch this. <laughs> Introducing Ectolife, the world's first artificial womb facility, powered entirely by renewable energy. Ectolife allows infertile couple to conceive a baby and become the true biological parents of their own offspring. It's a perfect solution for women who had their uterus surgically removed due to cancer or other complications. With Ectolife, premature births and C-sections will be a thing of the past. Ectolife is designed to help countries that are suffering from severe population decline, including Japan, Bulgaria, South Korea, and many others. The facility features 75 highly equipped labs. Each state-of-the-art lab can accommodate... So if you put on the... Um, the closed captions on this and you get into about, I'm trying to remember this video is about eight minutes long. So at about six minutes, it talks about the fact that, hey, you know, this this will be wonderful. You'll be able to have a baby. Uh, you won't need any kind of, you won't have contractions. You won't have pain. You won't have anything. You just have the baby and you don't have to do anything problem. There's no birth pains or anything like that. And they actually say this in the video. Now, beside the fact that this is incredibly creepy, creepy and beyond God's design, this is where these transhumanists and everything want to take this. The other thing kind of struck me was that when Jesus is talking in Matthew chapter 24 about the end times, he says that there will be birth pains. And so here is the, the, the man doing away with the very thing that Jesus used to describe how things were going to be in the end time, the increasingly close and painful contractions as you get closer and closer to the birth. So here's where they say, see, you can do this. You don't have any birth pains. You don't have any contractions. You know, you don't, it's not even messy. You can just go down there and pick the baby up at the lab and go back to work. Um, so this is just 
so creepy but this is the people i mean this is a proposed facility i think this facility they said would do thirty thousand births so uh now look i don't know how far along they are but the fact is that they're talking about it they're doing videos and everything means that they're moving along i want to show you another video uh one of the things that we talked about at the um at the conference Let's see, where is that? Oh, here it is. Uh, we, we saw the thing on, um, okay, so now I gotta go here and share tab. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, a talk, a TED talk that was given by uh, one of the heads of a company called Synchron. Uh, Synchron, I believe, is a Bill Gates funded company. It might also have Jeff Bezos involved. And they're, they're about brain implants. Um, this is um, rather scary. Uh, Neuralink did a big conference a couple of weeks ago. And, and I'm, I'm going to do a talk in Canada next year. And I think in the UK, I'm gonna, supposed to be in Scotland in, in March. And one of those talks I'm going to talk about uh, transhumanism and that sort of thing, but these brain implants. So Elon Musk, and you know, we all like Elon Musk trying to get a whole handle on Twitter, which he described this week as a uh, plane crashing into the ground. I have a little bit of recent experience about what that might feel like uh, sort of um, a week ago. But uh, somebody told me and said, well, all, all airplane landings are controlled crashes, which is kind of an interesting way of looking at it. And I think that comes from a pilot. But the brain implant, so I mean, I'm very concerned about this Neuralink thing that Elon Musk is involved in. And this is concerning. So here is a TED Talk uh, from a company. Um, so here we go. This is a TED Talk from Synchron about six months ago. Uh, and I want you to listen to the first part of this, just a minute or two. Here we go. It's in Vancouver, BC. Paralysis. Tweet out their thoughts. But I mean that literally. Philip O'Keefe can't use his fingers to type like you or I, but thanks to a tiny brain implant, he was able to send the following tweets. Hello world, short tweet, monumental progress. No need for keystrokes or voices. I created this tweet just by thinking it. My hope is that I pave the way for people to be able to tweet through thoughts. Phil. Now you might be thinking there are some people out there who should not be allowed to tweet directly from their brain. <laughs> I agree. But for people with paralysis and disability, this technology can be life-changing. I'm very excited to introduce you to Philip and Rodney. They both have a neurodegenerative disease called ALS, means they can't move their hands or speak clearly, but they can now text thanks to a brain-computer interface, or BCI. They will fill up brain signals up on the screen. They're connected to their computers via Bluetooth. The device is fully internalized, invisible to the outside world, and they learn to control the keyboard with clicks directly coming from their brain. Now, BCIs conjure up images of science fiction like The Matrix, with a cable jacked up into your brain through a hole in your skull, but I'm here to show you that the future can be much more elegant than that. So we got this group chat going, which I thought was a great idea until they started roasting me about the TED Talk. So that's... Um... This is where this is going. And so I want to um, go here. So I need to go to in a moment. Um, so this is an article by Joe Allen. He's on War Room uh, pretty regularly. Uh, it's called. Um, hardwired for control, the brain computer interface is already here. It's very interesting. If you, if you go, there's a, the Neuralink 
introductory video was several hours long, but somebody's mashed that down into about 25 minutes. And if you go through there, they, they sort of follow a progression. They, similar to what this TED talk is, Synchron, by the way, is already implanting this in people. Uh, they're in FDA approved trials. Neuralink is way, way above it uh, from a technological standpoint where they'll have thousands of connectors as opposed to what Synchron has. This is what they're pushing for. But the the discussion at the uh, uh, Neuralink was, listen, like they were starting here on the Synchron video you just watched. Uh, essentially, it says those who can't walk will walk. Those who can't see will see. Those who can't hear will hear. And it reminded me immediately. So we know that when this Antichrist figure comes, there's a lot of signs and wonders that are associated with this, lying signs and wonders. And it's an imitation of Christ. And so think about this. So the guy at the, the, the business guy at the Jewish, at the Christian media summit in Jerusalem actually said, the lame walk. That was a, that's an exact quote of what he said. And when he said that, I thought immediately of the passage in Matthew where uh, John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus and say, are you the one or do we look for another? And what does Jesus say to him? He says, you go back and you tell him the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. I probably have the order wrong. But I'm telling you is that the order of the way this was presented in the Neuralink presentation and, and the first one, the lame walk, was actually quoted from at this business presentation at the Christian Media Summit in Jerusalem. It, it just um, struck me that there's this imitation of Christ miracles that's coming. People will take claim for this. The lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. And I think that this is um, setting the world up for a massive deception. And, and in, notice in, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus used the birth pains. And so what do we have now? We have a whole company that's saying, hey, we can get rid of the birth pangs. Um, You have these other people who say, well, we're going to make the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. And it's an, it's an imitation, pseudo-Christ, pseudo-Christus, antichrist that's happening. And I, I'm concerned about it. Look, I'm not against, uh, I have a great niece who's totally deaf. Okay. I mean, I would love for her to be able to hear that would be so wonderful, but it's, it's the, it's the context of everything that's happening. And remember Jesus used the term birth pangs. And as I've said, quoting a friend of mine who once said, listen, this is not what what happens in the end times is a birthing process. It it goes over time and it gets more intense, more intense, more intense, and then boom, it's a, it's over. It's not a C-section. It's not an artificial womb. It's not a C-section. It's a birthing process. And now you have this whole thing set up in society to try to do away with that. I think that that's uh, fairly significant. And I can see my hope of keeping this to an hour has pretty much been blown out of the water. So we're going to do a couple more things. I'll probably do a midweek again since uh, I'm not going in, I'm not going to be playing any golf for the next few days. Although it's supposed to be 60 degrees here this coming Saturday. So hopefully things will um, uh, get off. So let me. Um, okay. So now I want to go to. So this thing, uh, this article, uh, there's a rise in anti-Semitism. It's something we've discussed in Israel quite a bit. And uh, it's it's concerning the way it, it's going. Um, this was at Berkeley Law. And when this happened at Berkeley Law, they some student organizations, Students for the Liberation of Palestine and others came in and said, well, you don't want anybody who supports Zionism, who believes that Israel should be a Jewish state coming here speaking, we're banning them, and they tried to get everybody blocked. Um, they, um, so um, this is Erwin Chemerinsky, who himself is Jewish, um, the dean of the uh, law school at Berkeley. 
he came in. He did think it was a big deal. Then it got picked up in some uh, papers. There was a guy named Marcus, Kenneth Marcus, who wrote a book or an article at Jewish Journal saying Berkeley develops Jewish free zones. And then everything kind of blew up. I think in hindsight, looking back, first everybody in the press came out and said, Oh, don't worry about this. This is just this, the kids have a right. They don't, they don't have to bring speakers. We can't force them to bring in speakers. But that wasn't their goal. Their goal was to completely shut everything down. Uh, and so I would highly recommend go to Jewish Journal and read this article, Berkeley Develops Jewish Free Zones. I think it's a pretty important article. And I'm not going to say much more about it, except that it's indicative of the rise of anti-Semitism. So again, also, I mentioned this. You want to go to uh, Jobot, uh, jobot.substack.com and get the article hardwired for control. The brain, brain computer interface is already here. It's pretty, um, it's pretty, uh, well, look at this article. This paragraph says last week, Synchron and their BCI bank rolled by the Palm scanning home invader, Jeff Bezos and the Island hopping Vax King, uh, Bill Gates with $75 million in total investment. Um, they're already in FDA trials and Neuralink hopes to be in FDA trials within the next uh, four to six months. Uh, it's a um, crazy world. So let's see here. That's the population. Let me shut that one down. So here, here's an example of anti-Semitism. So here is a, uh, a publication that came out and um, let me blow this one up here so it's full screen. Okay. So here is a, a publication. This is a, a website called Middle East Monitor. It's anti-Israel. It's pro-Arab anti-Israel. And so they have this thing, the myth of the Temple of Solomon. And so they they go through this whole thing about oh there's no there was never a Solomon's temple this is a myth and look they even these crazy Christians they build a uh, they build a temple of Solomon in Brazil and Sao Paulo and this was there was never been a temple of Solomon and they go in here they even cite this Bible this book by this uh, person uh, Israel Finkelstein who's a he doesn't believe any of the biblical narrative, so he interprets all the archaeological evidence against Israel. So, you know, he would say, oh, you see here the picture, mythological depiction of the Temple of Solomon. Um, so I'm going to show you a book. Uh, this is a book. Let me sh stop sharing the screen so you can see it. And this is a book uh, that I got from... I think I got it from Rand Randall Price at Liberty, a friend of mine, Al Haram Al Sharif. This is a republication. Maybe somebody sent this to me, by the way. I think somebody that listens online. This is a republication of a tour guide from 1924 that was published by the Waqf, who runs the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So back in 1924, when this was published, uh, this guy was the uh, the Hajiman al Husseini had been appointed by the British uh, to run the Temple Mount. He used to go to Germany and work with a certain leader in Germany to eradicate the Jews. There's, I think, some good evidence that he was the uncle of a guy who uh, was very anti Israel in his career, a guy named Yasser Arafat, uh, who was born in Egypt uh, and I believe was a nephew of this guy or at least a relative of this guy. But I want to show you uh, a page. Um, I'm going to have to read it so I can only show you the page briefly. But this is a tour guide. I think they published these in 1923 and 1924. And they have a page here. And it says, um, let's see if you can see that, historical sketch. Okay, so it has picture. You see the Dome of the Rock there and the picture on the... Um, like, what would that be? The left, <laughs> my right, your left. Okay. So listen to what this, listen to what this publication says. Okay. So now they're saying, oh, there's, there's never been a temple Solomon. This is a big myth. Listen, this stuff has only come up recently 
particularly after 1967 when the Jews took back the Temple Mount. So it says here, um, the two principal edifices are the Dome of the Rock on a raised platform in the middle and the Mosque of Al-Aqsa against the south wall. Then a couple sentences and it says this, on every side, trees break the prospect, which lend a peculiar charm to the scene. The site is one of the oldest in the world, and it is. I mean, this is where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. Uh, uh, and it's interesting how God uses these different places, and they build an altar, and then people build. That's how we know these, that these places are real. But listen to what it says. This is a direct quote. The site is one of the oldest in the world. Its sanctity dates from the earliest, perhaps from prehistoric times. Its identity with the site of Solomon's temple is beyond dispute. It says it right there. It is beyond, I don't know if it's in focus, it is beyond dispute. Um, this too is the spot, according to the usual belief, on which David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Um so they said it. I mean, this is the, this is the Muslim publication by the Walk from Jerusalem. From uh, this one's a republication, the one in 1924. You can, I think, you can find online a PDF of the one in 1923. It's just uh, so. Uh, this is just some of this um, um, stuff that you see. So that's uh, a myth of a publication. So I'm trying to think what I want to do here. Uh, I'm going to put most of this in an update, but I want to tell you about a couple things that I think are important. You need to watch Erdogan in Turkey. Uh, Turkey is rising, and it is a <coughs> something to be watched. And Erdogan's supposed to run for office next year, and his main opponent, I believe, was going to be the mayor of Istanbul. Um, oh, I probably ought to share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. So the the mayor of Istanbul was his opponent. And a couple of years ago, I think in 2019, the election was held and this guy won. So the government came in and said, oh, it wasn't a fair election. We need to redo it. Or I don't know if they had a do-over or a recount. I think they had a do-over. And in the do-over, he got even more votes. So he's a rival to Erdogan. And uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks, he was convicted. Uh, I think the uh, article says down here, uh, a court in Turkey sentenced the mayor of Istanbul, the country's most populous city, to two years and seven months in prison Wednesday on charges of insulting members of Turkey's Supreme Electoral Council. The court convicted him and also imposed a political ban that could lead to his removal from office. Uh, they're going to appeal. But uh, critics allege that the mayor's trial was an attempt to eliminate a key opponent of uh, Turkish President Erdogan. Turkey is scheduled to hold presidential and parliamentary elections in June. Polls indicate a drop in Erdogan's popularity amid an economic turmoil and inflation of more than 84%. So when you're in that kind of environment, probably the best way to get rid of the guy is or to, to get out of the problem is to get rid of the guy. So I've so uh, last uh, Wednesday in uh, Jerusalem, I went out to a dinner uh, with my friends Brian Schrager, Seth Fransman, and Jonathan Spire. And here's Jonathan's article uh, Friday in the Jerusalem Post. And I can tell you that this was um, a significant part of the dinner discussion was what's going on in the Middle East and what's going on with Ukraine, Russia, drones, all of these things. I mean, Jonathan Spire is one of the best Middle East war correspondents out there. And one of the talking was what's going to happen in Syria. And the talk was that, you know, there, there's going to be this, um, it looks like it's, it's, there's going to be a peace brokered and the peace is going to be able to make, uh, Turkey wants to go into Syria, but Turkey's making sounds like it wants to get together with Syria. So because Erdogan's got these elections coming up, he's making it look like I'm a man of peace. And so what they're going to do is they're going to broker a peace, and Russia is going to be the one that brokers the peace. And it's going to be um, 
make Russia look good. And then there's going to be other conflicts and Turkey's going to come in and be that. So I would highly recommend go to the Jerusalem Post, get Jonathan Spire, S-P-Y-E-R, article from Friday, December 23rd. Um, and you'll have a pretty good idea what we talked about over a great dinner at a restaurant in downtown Jerusalem uh, a week ago Wednesday. Uh, and as I said, I, I don't have time to go into it, but Jonathan is a great analyst and I highly recommend that you um, come in here, that you read this article because it's it's very, uh, it's an important article. So that's, uh, that's Jonathan's article. So here's uh, the thing I mentioned that Carrie Lake got ruled against. Um, I'll talk about this on Wednesday, Amir Avivi. I've got some a video of Amir on I-24 News. I don't know if it's on, we get it on our cable channel. So I get pretty good news from the Middle East and they were the ones who did a lot of things at the conference. So I recognized a lot of the people. Um, and I will, in my midweek, I'm gonna talk about this article from the New York Times. The ideal of this is from the New York Times last Sunday. They had four pages of uh, anti-Netanyahu, uh, the Israeli, the Jewish state is falling apart because of Netanyahu's government. It's the most right-wing government ever. And there is concern about some of the guys there and some of the things that they've said. Uh, but they don't have absolute power. I think they might be moderated, but there is a concern about the Netanyahu government. And I think some people in the Christian press community and in, in that live in Israel also express concerns about that. I don't happen to necessarily share those concerns, although I think it's something that we need to watch for. Uh, but uh, somebody, I see somebody in the comments saying, it sounds like the U.S. Listen, there's incredible parallels between the U.S. and Israel. Uh, in my view, the legal system in Israel is out of control. It's highly politicized. It's weaponized against people they don't like, hence the charges against Netanyahu. Um, and so there's there's a pushback. Uh, and it's very similar to what's happening in the United States with the J6 committee and their report and the criminal referrals, and they blame all of that on a certain former president. So um, I will talk about that in a midweek update. Also talk about uh, Amir, but just to give you, if you want to read about it, there is a um, European Parliament or the European Union has been funding things in uh, Area C. I want to pull up a little map of Area C. Give me one second here. And I'll try to talk while I'm doing this. So, um, Hang on a second here. Um, Google used to be a great thing to search for images, but they, they changed it. I'm not sure why. Okay, so here, let me. Okay. So this is, uh, this is area C. Um, the, the, Dark blue area is area C. That's under Israeli control. I want to make sure I say this accurately. Here we go. So here's area C. Uh, it's a map of the West Bank. It's actually uh, better called Judea and Samaria. And this dark blue area, that is... Um, Area C, it's supposed to be under kind of joint control. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the press today about the fact that Netanyahu wants to annex settlements, uh, Jewish settlements in Area C, and also take over security control of this entire area. Netanyahu is now pitching that, and I've been talking about this for a number of months, about... Uh, I guess I would call it a Saudi peace proposal called the Hashemite Kingdom of Palestine. And, you know, this is, I think, significant. I, I don't know whether it will happen, but it was published, it started in the Wall Street Journal back in June. 
then in July or August, there was a, a, a Arab press, a Saudi a guy put it out, I think with the approval of Mohammed bin Salman and now Netanyahu in, in a number of interviews, I'll show you, I can show you the clips saying, I want to make peace. I think the next thing we're going to do in the Abraham Accords is make peace with Saudi Arabia. But part of it relates to the Saudis have said, you don't solve the Palestinian issue. You don't get this. So Netanyahu, who's trying to play off both sides of his political problems, he's got problems on the left, people that want a two-state solution, and people on the right who don't want anything to do with this. So I think the compromise might be I'll, I'll exercise control over Judea and Samaria, security control, but I'll let it be governed in effect by Jordan. And Jordan's having uh, protests and everything right now. You know, their population is 75, 80% Palestinian Arab. Um, so there's a lot of things going on in this space. I'll talk more about it. But what the EU did was they came out and they proposed that or they there were documents leaked to the Israeli press. And uh, you can find it here. Uh, for example, I don't know if there's a copy of it in this article. Um Here's protest of Israeli MKs. What they want to do is they, they're trying to undermine Israel by allowing funding Palestinian settlements and building an area C. And this is uh, causing a lot of problems in the um, Arab press. Their like front page of the Arab news the other day was that the West Bank is on a knife's edge. So the world is on a cliff edge. The West Bank is on a knife's edge. And this is just Al. Um, all of this is, is coming down. So I'm going to talk about one more thing, two more things. I, somebody should count them and just shut me off if I'm, I go too far. Um, I think... Um, well, I'm not going to go back to my presentation because it takes too much time. So somebody asked a question about how will the Ukraine war end? I don't know. I am very concerned right now that we are giving, the U.S. is giving Patriot missile uh, battery or batteries to Ukraine. My understanding from talking to military people is that it takes a couple of years of training to operate those. So if those are put into the Ukrainian theater, and they start shooting down Russian things in Ukraine, then it's almost an indication that there are U.S. troops on the ground. And that's a very big escalation. And Putin has come out and been very clear he's not going to tolerate that kind of an escalation. I personally do not think that anybody is doing well in, the, um, in, this, in this area. In fact, I meant to, meant to say this. In this population pyramid thing that we talked about, um, I want you to look at Ukraine because this is a pretty shocking statistic. So here's Ukraine. Uh, look at their population. So right now, about 43 million when the war started. Um, they say by 2100 down to 24 million. It may be at that, it may be in that range right now. So many people have left and a lot of people have died. A lot of Russians have died. A lot of Russian mercenaries have died. It's just, it's a terrible thing. Russia's destroying the utility grid. Uh, people are going to, I don't know how to say it. They're going to freeze to death this winter. And I spent a, a lot of time talking to uh, someone from Ukraine and Israel last week. Um, and again, my concerns about Russia not doing well doesn't mean I'm pro-Ukrainian necessarily. I think the whole thing is a, is a horrible situation, but we also have to think, how does this fit into Bible prophecy? And I think that Russia's not doing well. And I think so logistically Russia, I don't think they can pivot and move to say an attack on is leading an attack on Israel. I just don't see that happening anytime soon. So maybe Russia's not the, the party that's involved. And there was an article in the uh, daily mail. Um, let's see. find it here. This is the other day in the uh, Daily Mail. 
saying that Russia will take up to 30 years to rebuild its economic and military strength after its war in Ukraine. Now, this is what Western officials believe. And I'm sure there's Ukraine, there's a, uh, um, Propaganda factored into this. Uh, this article says 100,000 Russian soldiers have been killed. That's consistent with information that I've gotten from a number of other sources, some of which I would not necessarily characterize as pro-Ukrainian. So it's not been good for Russia. Okay, it 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 doesn't look good, and I think that you know we've got to be realistic. So let me go to the article though. That is the one that uh, led to the title of this. And uh, I'm in the process. I'm trying to get a copy of this report. Uh, I've not been able to get it here. It's this article from um, last Tuesday in the Jerusalem Post. And this is an intelligence report. It's it's the first report of this kind that they've ever put out in Israel from this particular agency. There's a lot of reports that are coming out. So I'm trying to get a copy of this uh, before right now I'm going to have to rely on the reports of this, mainly in the Jerusalem Post uh, by Yoni Jeremy Bob. Uh, great article, December 20th, World Order is on a Cliff Edge. Look at what some of this article says. Uh, the world is at a transition point analogous to being on the edge of a cliff after which a series of crises striking simultaneously will reorder the planet's geopolitics the place of technology, the economic order, and a variety of other disciplines from health to energy, according to Israel's first government national intelligence estimate. Intelligence estimate. That's a pretty stunning uh, thing, and I don't think I can blow this up any bigger. So, you, But go to the Jerusalem Post and look up uh, World on a Cliff Edge. Um, so let me just read it a little bit. The report was published by the Intelligence Ministry copy obtained by the Jerusalem Post. According to the report, the world is on the verge of a cliff and is likely to be struck by a variety of crises affecting all aspects of life. Recommendations from a team of eight experts who wrote the report addressed all critical areas related to national power and resilience, including but going far beyond mere military power. So the, I would always say is um, welcome to the party. This is what we've been talking about at Fellowship Bible chapel um for years this is this is acceleration this is convergence this this whole report is based on consurgent uh, convergence uh some of the danger areas discussed were health energy and water the report also recognized a major change in israel's status since evolving from an energy weak country to energy independent with a find in recent decades of natural gas in its maritime coastal areas. Um, so they had a conference about this last week. Uh, I, fa I also, no, I don't think it's been discussed in some of the other um, think tanks that I follow. Uh, by the way, I have a, a, a group of think tanks that I follow. Uh, if somebody wants to grab a screenshot of this, um, I'll put up a, So I have a bunch of bookmarks on my browsers. And uh, so I have, a, for example, geopolitics and strategy. And you can see I have a whole bunch of different things bookmarked. Institute for Study of War, International Crisis Group, uh, IDSF, uh, that's Amir Vivi and my friends. I'm not sure why that didn't, uh, oh, come on. Um, so if you, so there's all these different, well, that's my front pages. Uh, so I follow all these different groups. So I, I read a lot of intelligence reports, estimates, that type of thing. Uh, bookmark them, follow them. Uh, they come out with some great information. For example, this is a website that I follow called Alma Research. And um, mainly based, it's based in the north of Israel up around the Lebanon border. And so they have an article up this week like... Uh, uh, there are civilian construction projects going on in um, in Lebanon, and they're building missile silos and that type of thing while they're doing it. So uh, follow this. But so listen back to this article in the Jerusalem Post. Uh, it's clear this is a very unique time. Um, Explaining the thinking behind formulating the report, Israel noted that until now, when there was a crisis in an arena like, like the environment, 
there has only been limited attention, but that such processes are on the verge of passing a tipping point where the negative impact on society will be far greater than before. Uh, so this is a, a, new, a different report. Again, this is the uh, from the article in the Jerusalem Post, world order is on a cliff edge. And I think we are. I mean, we are. I mean, how many how many people need to be recognizing all of these things happening at the same time? Artificial intelligence, technocracy, transhumanism, geopolitics, uh, Israel, disorder, disinformation, misinformation, conflict in society, completely divided societies. This is a significant time. So look, I'm going to do a midweek sometime this week. I try for Wednesday, usually end up on Thursday. Uh, but I will talk about some of these things, particularly the European Union interfering in, in Area C, directly interfering financially. Their own documents show that they are doing this. And we'll talk more about the rise in anti-Semitism, that type of thing. So Tuesday, I'll be on Stand Up For The Truth, Q90FM.com, listen live with David Fiorazzo. And I think I'm not going to take any questions right now. Uh, if you want to get them ready for my midweek update, uh, send them to me through Facebook Messenger or the church uh, website, fbchapel.com, has an email that I'll get um, those questions. So anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, let me just close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for informing us about the things that we can expect to happen in these times. We pray that you will uh, always remind us that our hope is you. Our hope is in your return and that we are secure in you, but that we need to stand firm in the faith and help us to do that, help us to get opportunities to share the gospel with those around us and to be thinking, intelligent, Holy Spirit-filled people who understand the times that we live in and the significance of those times. Bless us this week in Jesus' name, amen. So thanks so much for listening. I'm going to sign off now and uh, have a uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Talk to you in a couple of days.